This episode of Gather and Go is brought to you by Visit Savannah. Give your guests the opportunity to fall in love with Savannah, Georgia's hidden gems, coastal cuisines, exquisitely preserved history, and unique activities for groups of all sizes. Learn more at visitsavannah.com. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to Gather and Go, the podcast that helps you plan, promote, and lead better trips. I am Brian Jewell. I am your host, and I am sincerely grateful that you decided to spend some time with us today. Our featured conversation today is with Joe Venito. And if you don't know Joe, he is one of the most influential thinkers, developers, consultants in the group travel space. There is a good chance that you have experienced some of Joe Venito's work before and don't even know it yet. We're going to have a great conversation about how destinations and travel planners can put together experiences that are deep and authentic and are moving for their travelers. You won't want to miss that. Before we get to Joe, though, let's take a look at some travel news you may have missed. Now, unless you pay a lot of attention to the business press or maybe the travel trade press, you may not have heard about all the movers and shakers that have been trying to purchase, of all things, Spirit Airlines. That's right. There has been a bidding war for Spirit Airlines, the ultra low cost carrier. Uh, That bidding war has primarily been between JetBlue and Frontier, which is another ultra low cost carrier. Well, there has been a development after several months of back and forth. JetBlue has officially entered into an agreement to purchase Spirit Airlines. Uh, This comes after a really contentious bidding process uh, that included Frontier, as I mentioned, uh, and Frontier ultimately lost. For a while there, it looked like Frontier was actually going to win uh, that contest, but ultimately they have lost. Now, this still has to be approved by antitrust regulators at the Justice Department. They're going to be looking pretty closely into whether JetBlue and Spirit have too many overlapping routes because the thought process is if they offer too many routes that are exactly the same from one city to another city, then uh, by JetBlue buying uh, Spirit, uh, they may actually cut down on the number of options that consumers have in those cities flying those routes, and thus it could be considered an anti-competitive practice. So the DOJ has to uh, look into this. They have to sign off on it. Usually that's a long process, and experts expect that to take quite a while in this case. Uh, They say the approval, if it comes, is likely going to come sometime in 2024. So uh, that doesn't mean there's going to be immediate changes in the airline industry uh, this year or even in 2023, but it does mean that in the future, you could see some different options if you live in or travel to a city that is served by JetBlue or Spirit. What could that look like? Well, a lot of people think that if the deal is approved, that JetBlue is going to absorb Spirit's routes and convert Spirit's planes into JetBlue's configurations. Now, among the low cost and ultra low cost carriers, JetBlue is known for having very comfortable configurations with a lot of technology, live TV, et cetera, that sort of thing uh, in their seat. So people who travel JetBlue a lot are actually excited about this development because it would give them JetBlue style service and amenities on Spirit routes. And Spirit, along with many other low cost carriers, is known to be very no frills. So this could actually make the travel experience a little more pleasant for people who are flying those routes. So the winners in this deal, uh, in addition to JetBlue themselves, obviously, the winners are travelers in the cities that have Spirit, but not JetBlue, because in theory, they're going to get JetBlue level service. The losers, though, are travelers in cities that already have both, because What's likely to happen is that Spirit as a brand is going to go away. The Spirit routes and departures are going to be absorbed by JetBlue. And so those customers may have fewer options than they did before. Now, like I said, this isn't going to happen for quite a while. But if you like to know what's going on with airlines, this is an interesting one to keep your eye on. We'll see what the regulators say and how that impacts the travel business going forward. Now, moving on from travel news, it's time for our road tip of the week. I want you to think if you've ever been in this situation, especially if you lead groups on trips, whether that is as a tour operator, a tour escort, maybe you just have a bunch of friends that you travel together with. Have you ever wanted to notify everyone in the group all at once about something that they need to know during the trip, maybe a change of plans, something that is important to keep everybody on the same page and moving the same direction? Well, traditionally, you have a couple ways to do it. You can either make an announcement on the motor coach, which is fine, or you can perhaps post a sign in the lobby by the elevator somewhere, which 
is okay. Or you would have to go to your room and make phone calls to everybody else's rooms and hopes they're there or leave them voicemails. There haven't been great, easy, technologically friendly ways to get important messages out during a trip. So I want to tell you about a tool that could help you do just that. Now, uh, here at the Group Travel Leader, we partner with destinations quite a bit to host travel planners on familiarization tours. We do a lot of the groundwork in leading and facilitating those tours. And on every one of those tours we go on, we use an app called GroupMe to coordinate conversation and notifications among all the travelers. Now you may use GroupMe, this is a popular app throughout society. Anybody who has been involved in, let's say a volleyball team or some kind of civic organization, or maybe just a group of friends that likes to keep in touch, you may already be part of a GroupMe or several GroupMe's. And if so, well, you understand just how helpful this is. But if you're not familiar with it, GroupMe works essentially like a group texting service. But why would you use this instead of text messaging? Well, a number of reasons. Number one, there's a limit on how many people you can put on a group text message. And if you have a whole tour group, let's say several dozen people, you can't put all their phone numbers on a group text message and get a message out to them all at once. But with GroupMe, you can. Another big advantage is that if you put everybody on a group text, that exposes the phone numbers of everyone who is on that text thread to everyone else who's on that text thread. And if you're all friends anyway, that's not a big deal. But if you're dealing with people that may not know each other very well, may not be to the point where they want to share all their contact information with everyone else in the group, then having a service like GroupMe is a really smart way to go because you can get your message out to everybody, but they don't share that contact information with one another. So what does this look like on a trip or getting ready for a trip? Well, basically you sign up for the group me service. You put everybody's phone numbers in the app beforehand and it will send them a notification saying, Hey, you've been added to a group me. And uh, depending on how they set it up, they can either download the app onto their phones and message directly through the app, or they can choose not to download the app and simply get your messages coming to their phone as text messages, but they won't be involved in getting everybody else's contact information. So once you have that set up, you go on your trip and if you need to notify people about a change, maybe you need to leave the hotel earlier than you had planned on. Maybe your itinerary has changed. Maybe there's been a small emergency and you need to get the word out to everyone that there is a different meeting place. All sorts of things can happen. You just send one message out through the GroupMe app and it's delivered to everyone in your group instantly, just like a text message would be. I've also seen groups that use this for uh, sharing photos, so you don't have to get the phone number of the person sitting on the bus next to you and swap photos by text, or you don't have to try to you know, send them by email afterwards or put together a Facebook group or anything like that. People can send photos the instant they take them. So if somebody takes a really fun group photo, they don't have to send it to a bunch of people. They can just post it in the group me and everybody has it. It's also really convenient because that means if you're taking a group photo somewhere, you don't have to have 12 different people stopping to take the photo with their own phones. You can designate one person as the official photo taker. That person can send the photo in the group me right after they take it and everybody has it. It saves you a ton of time, saves a bunch of hassle, and it can be a really convenient and important tool for getting a message out quickly when you need to. So we will put a link to the GroupMe app in the show notes to make it easy for you to find. And that is your road tip of the week. Now, before we move on, I've got some exciting news to share from us here at the Group Travel Leader. We have recently welcomed a brand new addition to our sales team. I want you to please welcome Bryce Wilson. Bryce is a great young man from right here in Lexington, Kentucky, where we are based. He's a graduate of Eastern Kentucky University and just a delightful guy. It's been a pleasure for us to get to know him. He is a sales account manager for us and is standing by at the ready to help you with any questions you might have about how to market your travel product to group travel planners, tour operators, travel agents, people who make buying decisions in the group travel market. So you can reach Bryce at Bryce, B-R-Y-C-E at grouptravelleader.com or by calling 888-253-0455. And Bryce, uh, along with our director of sales, Kyle Anderson, are both available at that number and would love to help you get your message out to group travel planners around the country. Now, it's just about time for us to get into our featured interview with Joe Venito. But before we do, I want to encourage you to hang around to the end of the interview, because after we're done with that conversation, I have a hot minute about how you can use travel to help put an end to the culture wars that are tearing America apart. You won't want to miss that. 
We'll be right back with Joe Venito. All right. So if you're looking for even more reasons to make plans to visit Savannah, look no further. From the moment you arrive, you'll be greeted with moss-draped live oak trees, fresh coastal breezes, and enchanting history around every cobblestone street. Savannah strikes a delicate balance between hip and historic. Casual, but cool. Elegant, yet approachable. Spend the day exploring the city's illustrious culture, roaming through the green city squares while sipping on your go-to cocktail before hopping a trolley to your next adventure. The best experiences happen when you let Savannah take you along for the ride. You never know what characters you'll meet or what's in store for your next tour. And that's just the way they like it. See why groups of all sizes fall in love with Savannah at visitsavannah.com. All right, everybody, my guest today is the Chief Experience Officer at Veneto Collaboratory, a management consulting and training company in Greater Boston. He collaborates with destination marketing organizations, hospitality companies, travel attractions, and service-related companies to create results that generate economic development, drive customer engagement, and loyalty. He is the creator of the Experience Formula, a process that enables destinations, attractions, and service-related organizations to develop and deliver memorable customer experiences. Joe Venito, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here today. It's great to have you. So uh, you have a long history in tourism. Uh, tell us when you first got involved in travel professionally. So my f- first foray, I should say, in travel professionally uh, was just out of college. Mm. Uh, my first job was as a tour director for Young's Travel in Worcester, Massachusetts, which was a sister company at the time of Colette Tours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, what time in history was this? Yeah, so uh, so it was the 80s. Okay. And uh, so in the 80s, I mean, it was the golden years of the motor coach industry, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. you had lots of groups traveling. You had uh, people that were going around the country, some on motor coach, uh, some on air. And, um, you know, as I was... A, a good, well, actually a great tour guide, I will say. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the crazy things that I would do is, you know, we'd have the itinerary, but I'd look at how could I enhance the experience of the guests? Mm. And I'd look for those, you know, added elements of the experience. And in one such experience, which I talk about in my programs, um, going to the Amish country in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, with a local guide, we spent the day with Mary Alice Brubaker. And at the end of the day, we stopped at an Amish woman's house and she got on the coach and sold sugar cookies. Well, I mean, this was the the grand slam of the four days in the tour. Mm. And so as I looked at this, I thought, OK, there's power in experiences. I need to replicate this. And so the seeds got planted very early on in my professional career as a tour guide. So can you help uh, people who, you know, maybe weren't involved in tourism in the 80s, uh, set the stage for them of what what the typical itinerary was like? What were guests doing on group tours and how does that differ from the vision that you saw uh, for what could be done? So interestingly enough, you know, 80s and 90s, um, it was kind of a one size fit all. So people would you know, they'd, they'd have an itinerary and they were traveling and they were super excited. They were going on the road and, um, you know, people were just thrilled to be on the road. They, you know, they were they were going, they were exploring, they were seeing new sites, you know, um, and with all of that, they were thrilled. But as as times changed, there was this deeper, richer sense that there was more to the experience. Mm. and. You know, and in the 90s, what you had was not the sort of the golden age of of motor coach, but you had aging baby boomers. And so late 90s, early 2000s, what you had, it was two things happening. Baby boomers were starting to retire and travel. And these are people that had traveled for their jobs. Mm. So they weren't content on, you know, going to the Poconos or the Amish country or, you know, Florida in many cases, they had been to these places. So how could they see them again at a deeper, richer level, right? Mm. 
Um, and so as that was happening, people in our industry were looking, right? In the group market in particular, you had destinations that were looking and they were saying, how do we freshen up what we have? How do we create some new, richer experiences in our destination? And Philadelphia was actually one of those destinations. In 2004, they had, they had contacted me after hearing a program on customer experience. And they said, you know, people come to Philadelphia and they see the historic area and they think they've seen it, but there's so much more. Mm. And so that one phone call led to a project in Philadelphia where the vice president had said, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have you work with about a dozen of our attractions, historic sites, our restaurants, et cetera. And I want them to really be able to create something new. Mm. And what I would say is sort of post my tour guide career. Uh, so I was a full-time tour guide for a couple of years, but went into product development. And the vast majority of my experience during my 18 year career with tour companies and tour operators was designing and developing tour product that we would then take and sell. Mm. So using the, the eyes of a tour guide, staying close to the customer, I was designing and developing you know, product in states, groups of states, provinces of Canada, regions, and then countries. But again, with this filter of what are the experiences? What's the essence of that place? And then how do we engage or immerse people in that place to give them this deep, rich experience that, you know, is going to change them in some way? So when you're in that product development era, uh, are the people, the tour companies that you're working with, are they looking at some of the ideas and suggestions and itineraries you're bringing them? And are they saying, well, wait a minute, that's not how we do it. Or are they really enthused and saying, this is a great idea. We're excited about trying this. So it's a little bit of both, right? I mean, one of the key things that we, when I worked for Colette Tours for many years, you know, one of the keys with Colette was our secret sauce and our formula and how do we distinguish ourselves among our competition. And so while the, the roots and the itineraries might look similar, there were these elements, if you will, mm. or fingerprints and some of those elements weren't even in the itinerary. Mm -hmm. So we were looking for those kinds of things that would give us that competitive advantage. And they weren't things that people could replicate. That was ideally what we were trying to do. It, take us through that Philadelphia um, experience, for instance. So the people in the historic area want a way to create a more engaging customer experience. So how did you get in there in the city with the partners, with the historic properties and help them unearth uh, these experiences that would be so much more dynamic. So interestingly enough, um, in Philadelphia, we focused on things that were not in the historic area, okay. right? Because again, they had some great experiences, but we worked with organizations like the Mural Arts Program, for instance. They had tours, right? Philadelphia is the home of the largest collection of murals anywhere in the world. And they had tours. And I said, well, that's great. But how do we get to an engaging or an immersive level? Mm. And so with them, what we did was we worked uh, on an experience called Meet an Artist. Mm. And so the engaging level of that was where you're taken on the tour with an artist to see their murals that they help design with the community or the neighborhoods. You hear the story of that. And then you also go and see a mural that's in progress. So you actually see how a mural is done. But then there was a, a higher level of experience called the immersion level, and that's called paint a mural. Mm. And so we designed a paint a murally experience because as I told them, I want my mural bragging rights. And at first they were like, well, look, I mean, that means we'd need all kinds of insurance and scaffolding, but they did realize that there was a way to paint a mural and it's done on parachute cloth where the mm. artist sketches out the mural and then participants paint the mural. And basically, once completed, you can adhere it and seal it to a building so it looks like a regular mural. And, and if you think about it, our work over the past 17, 18 years, right, you look at destinations 
really around throughout North America, mm -hmm. right? And there are some that are iconic and that they have these iconic attractions. But what do you do if you're a destination, you know, that doesn't have an iconic attraction, right? Right. right. Um, and we've worked like Madison, Wisconsin is a great example, right? So Madison, Wisconsin, so it's the it's the capital of the state of Wisconsin. We worked with them a couple of years ago on designing a whole group of essential Madison experiences. And these are local experiences that are part of the fabric of Madison and literally immerse you into um, the destination, right? And these experiences used for groups. Mm -hmm. So whether it's tour groups, motor coach companies, but also meetings, conferences, conventions, mm -hmm. sports teams, destination weddings, et cetera. And so these are used to, to give people that deeper, richer experience and get people in to the destination. Yeah. I, I'm really happy you brought up Madison because uh, there's, there's a bit of a, a difference between a Philadelphia, which has so much iconic um, stuff, as you mentioned, and then a Madison, which is a great city. Uh, lots of cool stuff to do, but maybe doesn't have the level of uh, consumer awareness that a Philadelphia does. So when you go into a place like Madison, uh, what are you looking for? How do you help the locals identify the treasures they have uh, that maybe are just hidden in plain sight or that they're not even aware of? Great question. So what I like to do is I like to do a little bit of an assessment, mm -hmm. right? So we do some secret shopping, kind of look around. And I try to look at what I call the essence of a destination. So if you think the, the essence, the attributes, the attractions, and then I like to ask myself, what are the experiences that I can have? And a lot of times there are gaps mm -hmm. in terms of experiences, right? Now, uh, a quick example. So when you think of Wisconsin, most people think, you know, cheese. Right. And uh, one of the experiences, you know, we designed was a cheese board building experience. Oh, nice. Now, of course, you can go into a restaurant, you can eat cheese, but Wisconsin cheese from artisanal cheese makers. So the Concourse Hotel, which is one of the properties right downtown, uh, they created an experience which incorporated a cheese board building experience, learning about artisanal Wisconsin cheeses along with a wine tasting. So you build your cheese board, which is Instagrammable, yeah. and then you get to consume your cheese board. Yeah, I want to put on my uh, tour planner hat uh, and give you some, um, I don't want to say pushback, but I want to tell you some objections that I often hear from people when I have these kind of conversations with them. Uh, many people will say, you know, value is very important to my travelers. I need to keep the price point low. And so the way I do that is by eating at buffets and, you know, getting discounted museum admissions. And these ideas you're talking about sound cool, but they also sound expensive. So could you, could you address that? Number one, it, it, for somebody to build a tour like this, is there a lot of additional expense or is that kind of a myth? So I would say that these are all deeper, richer experiences mm -hmm. and they do, they, they, they do come with a bit of a premium, mm -hmm. right? But operators have the ability and what I would say, it's, it's kind of a mix. Include some of those experiences mm. and then use some of the other opportunities, whether it's, you know, on your free time, et cetera, to give people an option mm. to be able to go and do these experiences. And most operators, you know, have the sophistication to be able to reserve these in advance. Yeah. So again, it's a balance. I would also say that, um, you know, Operators need to understand that if they want to create some competitive advantage, mm. they need to be able to distinguish their offerings from their competition. Could you offer some tips to, you know, like a mom and top uh, mom and pop tour operator for how they can communicate that value to their travelers? So when they're putting their brochure together or doing their email marketing, talking to people about specific departures they're trying to sell, how do they communicate the value and the richness of that experience in a way that's going to resonate with the customer and the customer will understand, oh yeah, I might pay a little bit for this, but it's well worth it. What are some of the, the key ideas they should communicate? Well, to me, I think it's the fact that, you know, if I was an operator trying to 
sell my group or my tour to to people, I would say that, you know, that the uniqueness and the specialness of going with my company includes these elements that that only we include. Mm. Number two, you know, these are experiences that are going to create memories that you've got for a lifetime. Mm. Right. And and it's really not about seeing things and checking them off on a list. It's really about experiencing them at a deeper, richer level. And, you know, most people, um, I like to say, are we're experienced junkies. Yes. And in a sense, you know, experiences are the currency of 21st century travelers. Right. And so, you know, when most of us travel, you know, we don't think about, oh, I want to go and check this off of the list or I want to say I've been there. Right. Most of us are thinking about what are the experiences that we can have in those destinations. So uh, one thing that has become uh, very important to many people is uh, cultural encounters and uh, travel experiences that help them have authentic moments of exchange uh, with cultures that are maybe not their own, with uh, different races, nationalities, ethnic backgrounds. Tell me about um, what you're seeing now about destinations using experiential tourism to help facilitate cultural exchange and diversity and increased understanding. We actually were working with Louisville Tourism mm -hmm. um, and they were um, looking to expand the African-American visitor base. So they were looking at expanding leisure base, but also groups. And they were hosting the African-American Travel Conference. And so uh, they wanted to create some deeper, richer experiences that were connected to the, the brand pillars of Louisville. Mm -hmm. uh, so we took a look um, and we looked at bourbon, we looked at horse racing, we looked at history, and we looked at contributions of the African-American community in Louisville. Yeah. And uh, we designed a whole collection of experiences called the Unfiltered Truth Collection. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time these were being designed, they were being designed for, for travel. But as things unfolded in 2020 and 2021, everybody realized the importance of these experiences, not just for travelers, but for the community. Mm. And so this collection of seven different experiences immerses people into these iconic brand pillars, if you will, but experiences. So for instance, um, you can go to Evan Williams mm -hmm. and you can meet Tom Bullock. Uh, Tom Bullock was the first African-American to write a cocktail book. Mm -hmm. So it is prohibition and you're actually meeting Tom Bullock who's mixing you an old fashioned. And then he, and he does some, some tastes of some other great, uh, great stuff as he calls it, that he's not going to tell you where he got it. <laughs> uh, in addition to that, the Kentucky Derby museum. So we created two experiences with them. Uh, we created one experience that's tied to black jockeys mm -hmm. because during the first 25 years of the running of the Kentucky Derby, 18 of those races were won by black jockeys. Wow. And so there's this rich history, jockeys, trainers, et cetera. Uh, and so taking and really bringing those stories to life. So you go through Churchill Downs. And you learn about the history and the heritage of black jockeys and trainers through the years. Yeah. And then we created another experience called Proud of My Calling, which are characters who portray these people. Mm -hmm. And you learn firsthand about their stories. And both of these experiences, absolutely amazing. And again, they're done to foster connection and understanding for the contributions of the African-American community. Yeah, absolutely. I was in Louisville uh, last year and I got to do some of those things with a group and they're wonderful experiences. They're incredibly compelling stories. And, you know, if I could just get on my soapbox for a minute and say, uh, this is not just uh, black history for black groups. Uh, people of every ethnicity, nationality, race, culture, gender, need to do these things because number one, they're just fantastic travel experiences. But number two, they uh, connect us to parts of our story that we don't often hear. And so this is just as important for white groups 
uh, mixed race groups, Asian groups. I mean, it's it, you don't really know Louisville until you hear these stories. So uh, it's not just, you know, for the African-American market. It's really for all of us. Brian, you're absolutely right. And when you think about a destination and you think about the flavor or the vibe of a destination, in many cases, it's directly connected to the cultural groups and the people mm. that are part of the landscape, right? And so in Louisville, it's African-American. In Richmond, British Columbia, which is just outside of Vancouver, we created a whole collection of experiences around Pacific authentic experiences. Richmond is the most culturally diverse city in Canada per capita mm. of any city in the country. Wow. And so we connected experiences tied to Pacific authentic countries and communities of immigrants that have come in and we tell their stories. So whether it's African-American, whether it's Asian, whether it's Hispanic, whether it's Native American, all of the flavor and the cultural richness of destinations, there's a story there. How do we elevate those stories into experiences? And those experiences, I believe, they create connections that make us a deeper, richer country. Yeah, absolutely. And they make everybody who has that experience better off. They're, they're better for it, for sure. So you do a lot of uh, individual work uh, with clients, but you also run events where destinations can come in and sort of learn your methods and workshop some of this uh, with you and your team. So tell us about the Experience Lab and uh, what that experience is like for somebody who attends. Sure. So a number of years ago, um, we had destination marketing management organizers um, and execs that were interested in our work. And they had seen it in Philadelphia, Columbus, Ohio, Virginia Beach. And they said, you know, we want to see this. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, why don't we create an experience lab, an immersive experience? And we've, we've done this every, every year except 2020 mm -hmm. uh, since, uh, since 2011. And it's designed to bring in destination marketing execs along with attraction partners. Mm -hmm. uh, and you come into a city. Um, this year, it's going to be held in Louisville, mm -hmm. October 3rd through the 5th. Um, and it's designed to immerse people in experiential tourism. Um, it, this year, we're going to showcase again the Unfiltered Truth Collection. Mm -hmm. And it's tied to these amazing experiences that I was just talking about. But it's not just multicultural experiences. Any destination can come in, take a look. And many destinations have chosen to bring a couple of attractions with them so that they can also experience this. I like to say it's a little bit a classroom so you can learn about the process that we use. But more importantly, you get immersed in mobile workshops. Mm. And so you learn about how the experiences were created um, and then we go a little bit behind the curtain and give you sort of the rest of the story. And uh, it, it's it's been amazing to to see people, you know, go through the the experience lab. I mean, I like to say that my goal is to to actually ruin people. In other <laughs> words, that you'll never look at the experience or an experience as you're traveling the same way again. What is uh, the best way for people to learn more about the Experience Lab or uh, about you or, or follow you and your work online? So um, the best way to catch me is uh, www.venitocollaboratory.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also uh, follow me on LinkedIn. Easy to find Joe Venito. And uh, again, Joe Venito or Venito Collaboratory um, forward slash Experience Lab. And any of those will will get you to to us. And again, if there are tour operators that are interested in creating deeper, richer experiences in their destinations, um, we'd love to have them as well as destination marketing organizations or, or attractions. So uh, before we let you go, we have a few questions we ask everybody. Uh, these are just for fun. No pressure. So you can just kind of answer off the top of your head. Uh, first of all, is it a window seat or an aisle seat for you? It's an aisle. Yeah. You and me both. I don't want to step over people when I'm having to get up on the airplane for sure. You got it. Okay. So what's one thing uh, in your carry on that you would never travel without? I would never 
go anywhere without my cell phone and a charger. Oh my goodness. Those things have to come together. <laughs> if I find myself somewhere without a charger, like I, I'm going to drop 50 bucks on a charger if that's what it takes. <laughs> you can take the clothes, the suitcase, those can be replaced, but the phone and the charger, absolutely not. <laughs> those are the essentials. Yep. So uh, if you had a free airline pass and a week with no work to do, where do you think you would go? Free airline pass and no work. Um, I would, I'd go, go to France. Yeah. Um, it is my, it, one of my favorite places on the planet. Uh, I speak French mm. and to be immersed in, in France, um, that, that's kind of my, uh, that's kind of my, my sweet spot. Uh, uh, I also have some other, you know, spots in the world mm -hmm. that I'm, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm trying to get to, I would say, uh, Vietnam and Thailand are, are on the bucket list, mm. but probably going to take more than a week. And that's yeah. more, uh, more itinerary based, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, wonderful, wonderful answers. So last question, what is something you have seen or done on the road that you wish you could go back again and experience with somebody you love? Mm. I would say one of the most powerful experiences that I have ever had, uh, I had mentioned earlier, independence after hours. Mm. And this is an experience that I did in Philadelphia a number of years ago, where uh, you go in and you have dinner at one of the taverns, you meet a number of historic characters. But the highlight for me was going into Independence Hall mm. after hours. Mm. It's, it's July 3rd, 1776. Wow. And there's a rumor afloat that there's something big that's about to happen. Mm. And as you go in, and again, this is a very, very small group. So I was in there with maybe 15 people. Mm. And you're going in and Caleb, the bartender from the restaurant, is taking you in because he's got a buddy who's letting you in. Mm. And as you go in, all of a sudden, there's some arguing. And you hear in the hall arguing. And as you go out, it's Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And they're arguing about this document that Jefferson has written. Mm. And it, it, it's amazing. But to me, not just seeing them in character, but being able to go in to the rooms where they, they discussed and drafted these. And I had about five minutes by myself. Wow in that room wow and just to feel the energy and what these people were thinking i mean just something i will never forget yeah that is incredible what a way to end jovanito thanks so much we'll have to have you back and do it again brian thank you much appreciated great to be with you Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Joe Benito. I hope you took a lot away from it because there was so much good stuff in there. In fact, so much that I want to take a minute and just recap some of the things he said that I think are especially important for us to take into account as people working in travel in 2022. You know, one of the things he said is that if you want to create some competitive advantage, you need to distinguish your offerings from your competition. Now, I have looked at enough tour operator websites and tour itineraries and talked to enough travel planners to know that a lot of you guys are doing the same trips as a lot of the rest of you guys. That's right. A lot of your itineraries look almost exactly the same. And there's nothing wrong with going popular places and doing iconic things when you travel. But I got to tell you, if you want to succeed in the age of travel we live in today, you have to set yourself apart from your competitors. And honestly, you have to set yourself apart from what people can put together on their own. You have to set yourself apart from uh, people booking their trips by themselves online, Googling what is fun to do, buying those tickets and just going and doing it. And so if you don't have experiences that you are able to offer your travelers that they can't get anywhere else, you're going to lose market share to those competitive organizations. And maybe more than that, 
you're going to lose market share to the internet. Because if you're just offering airfares and hotels and transportation and some attraction tickets, well, people can book that on their own. They don't really need you for it. So find that way to create competitive advantage. And I think a great way to do it is by offering those experiences that nobody else offers. Along those same lines, Joe told us it's not about seeing things and checking them off of a list. It's about experiencing them at a deeper, richer level. And he said experiences are the currency of 21st century travelers. You know, Joe is absolutely right about this. People care more about what they experience than simply what they can see or take pictures of. Because here's the thing. Everybody's got pictures of everything now, and you can find pictures of a popular travel destination in about five seconds with a quick Google search. But what you can't replicate online is the experience of actually being there, of actually meeting somebody, of having an authentic interaction with another human being. Those experiences are so important and they are so valuable to the travelers that you are trying to reach every day. Finally, Joe said, when you think about the flavor and vibe of a destination, in many cases, it's connected to the cultural groups and the people that are part of the landscape. And he went on to say those experiences create connections that make us a deeper, richer country. You know, if there is anything America needs right now, it is more experiences, more forces that bind us together and make us deeper and richer and help us overcome the divisions that are making life right now absolutely insane. And that brings us to the hot minute. That's right. The hot minute is the portion of the show where I take 60 seconds to give you my unfiltered views on an issue impacting travel every day. Today's hot minute is all about the culture wars in the United States and the role that travel can play in helping maybe bring us to a ceasefire. So let's put 60 seconds on the clock and get into it. Okay, so it is no secret that America right now is more polarized than it has been well, perhaps in my whole lifetime, perhaps in your whole lifetime, maybe since the Civil War. And one of the things that's making it so bad is we have this huge divide between the red states and blue states and uh, this culture war that has been brewing between people who see life in very different ways. You know, I think one of the biggest things driving this culture war is the fact that too many people spend too much time in their own cultural silos and never go anywhere else. So I want to issue a challenge to anyone who plans travel. And that is this. Take your travelers to a place where people see the world differently than you do. That's right. If you are from a deep blue state, go to a deep red state. If you're from a deep red state, go to a deep blue state. Have some of these authentic experiences. Have real exchange with people who see the world differently than you do. You don't have to talk about politics. You don't have to get into the issues of the day. But by being in those places and getting to know those people, you're going to see them differently and just maybe bring down their temperature in America. That is the hot minute for today. You don't have to agree with me. I'd love it if you did. But even if you disagree, we can still be friends. So agree, disagree, whatever it is, let us know. You can send us an email at podcast at group I read every email that comes to that address and you never know your questions, comments, or ideas might just be the topic of the next hot minute. Well, that about does it for this episode of Gather and Go. We would love before we go to ask you to do us a favor. Go over to your podcast player of choice. Give us a rating. Give us a review. That helps us get the word out about the show and let other people know about what we're doing. And hey, if you haven't already subscribed to the show, hit that subscribe button while you're there and you will get the next episode in your sleep. My thanks once again to Joe Venito. On the next episode of Gather and Go, we're going to have a conversation with Eddie Lutz from the Creation Museum in the Ark Encounter, who's going to help us understand faith-based travel and how you can reach this important segment of the travel industry and deliver dynamic faith-based travel experiences for your travelers. Until then, remember this. At the end of the day, we're all on this trip together, so let's make it a good one. See you next time on Gather and Go. Gather and Go is hosted and executive produced by me, Brian Jewell. Our publisher is Mac Lacey. Donya Simmons is our creative director. Ashley Ricks is our circulation manager and graphic designer. Our sales team is Kyle Anderson and Bryce Wilson. To advertise on the podcast, call Kyle or Bryce at 888-253-0455. Gather and Go is a production of The Group Travel Leader. 
For more information about our magazines, podcasts, and events, visit us online at grouptravelleader.com. This episode of Gather and Go was sponsored by Visit Savannah. Savannah, Georgia's charm can be found in its rich history, tree-lined cobblestone streets, exciting events, and unbeatable dining experiences. Check out visitsavannah.com to see why your next tour should stop in Savannah.